After four months of constant shelling and attacks, the Bakhmut fortress is still standing. Continuous Russian strikes have not made Ukrainian soldiers give up their positions as they prepare to face the new wave of terror coming their way. Since May, the front line remained almost unchanged with only a couple of small victories achieved by Russian forces. However, a new threat has appeared on the horizon in the form of a full Russian mobilization. Kremlin has recruited hundreds of thousands of men, most of whom were sent to fill the broken lines at such sections of the front as Bakhmut. For the whole month of September, Russia continued to demonstrate its true nature. After constant shelling of the civilian city, the outcome was tragic. The Palace of Culture, which was a base for humanitarian headquarters, was burned down along with the local fire department. A missile strike on the 22nd of September destroyed the main bridge across the Batmutka River that bisects the city, disrupting both civilian travel and Ukrainian military logistics. It was a strategic objective of the Russians to cut off the supply of Ukrainian forces and terrorize the city. At the end of September 2022, the fighting continued to be of a positional nature around a small town called Zaitsevo, resulting in zero success for the Russians. For the course of the next month, the invaders kept holding and reinforcing their own positions with little to no effort of advancing further. It was quiet, but the storm was coming. From the end of October, Russia began shelling the city using Iranian drones sent to them earlier that month. Those drones played a key role in strengthening their offensives, giving them a more effective way of bombing the Ukrainian positions. Even that did not allow them to have any significant results with thousands of Russian soldiers dying day after day in the area around Bakhmut. However, as miserable as they were, the Russian armed forces were learning and began to change their approach. Huge human resources allowed them to constantly fill the positions and try new strategies. They began concentrating forces for attacks on a narrow front in order to gain an advantage there and be able to push through Ukrainian defenses with such pointed, targeted attacks. This allowed them to capture three small villages in the south, Andrivka, Ozaryanivka, and Zelenopilia, and continued to make limited gains around Bakhmut. Russian forces continued to advance close to the southeastern outskirts of the city and also established control over the Seversky Donetsk Canal. 13 kilometers southwest of Bakhmut, which directly impacted the water supply to most of the nearby cities. The increased morale from small victories has allowed them to develop offensive operations northeast of Bakhmut around Solidar, however, without achieving any success in that area. The Bakhmut front was becoming more and more bloody day after day. The areas around the city became graveyards for thousands of troops, and the trench warfare reminded of horrors happening during the First World War. The Eastern Command of Ukraine reported that the Bakhmut sector is the most bloody, cruel, and brutal sector of the front of the Russian-Ukrainian war so far. It could become a pivotal point in this war. The enemy continues to assault different settlements every day. They conducted 261 attacks with an artillery of various calibers in the past 24 hours alone. As of the beginning of December, the plan has not changed significantly. The Russians kept trying to storm Solodar, advancing on the villages south of Bakhmut and also pushing on the eastern border of the city from the side of the occupied territories. Ukrainian forces were fighting for every centimeter of land, making it an impossible task for the Russians to progress further. In the meantime, hundreds of bombs were landing on civilian infrastructure, leaving a city that was once home to around 10,000 people in ruins. President Volodymyr Zelensky accused Russia of destroying Solodar, calling it another Donbas city that the Russian army turned into burnt ruins. On the 11th of December, Russian sources claimed that Wagner fighters had breached defenses in East Bakhmut, occupying the Zabakhmutka district. They have also established full control of the Bakhmut winery Siniat. Russians began advancing further, deep into the city with Ukrainian forces trying to stop the attack. This led to a number of street fights in the eastern sector of Bakhmut. The city began to look like a front line with trenches being dug up right at the city center. The fights lasted for seven days with Ukrainian forces pushing the enemy back with the support of British Cougars. Around seven Russian infiltration groups were destroyed, with Ukrainian armed forces recapturing the eastern outskirts of the city. 
On the 20th of December, the Ukrainian president made a secret visit to the frontline city of Bakhmut. This was a courageous move to bring up the morale of the soldiers and give them the strength to continue the fight. In the meantime, Russian forces continued offensive operations around Bakhmut. Wagner Group conducted an assault northeast of Bakhmut near Pithorodna, and fierce fighting continued on the eastern outskirts. Ukrainian forces recaptured and continued to hold Opidna, blunting Russia's advance from the south. The city of Bakhmut continued to suffer. By the end of December, it was reported that over 60% of the infrastructure has been destroyed. By the 28th of December, Russian forces had grown tired and unable to sustain the previous scale of artillery and infantry assaults. The massive losses of personnel and equipment in the Bakhmut area severely degraded the offensive. At the time, it would seem that the battle was near culmination. However, it was far from over. At the beginning of January, Russian forces launched a massive attack on Solodar, trying to cut off the Ukrainian forces in the Bakhmut area and continue the encirclement. The battle for the city continued for the whole week, after which Ukrainian troops were forced to withdraw. Capturing Solodar would help Russia approach Bakhmut from the north, but an encirclement still remained a distant goal. To cut Ukraine's supply line, Russia would need to establish control over at least two highways west of Solodar. Russians began intensifying attacks near Klitschivka in order to complete the encirclement, which they believed will force Ukrainian troops to withdraw as far back as Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. On January 20th, reports suggested that Russian forces managed to capture Klitschivka. However, at least three major Ukrainian ground lines of communication remained under control. The attacks on all small settlements around Bakhmut continued daily, resulting in little or no success at all for the Russian side. It was a major failure for the Wagner Group forces who promised to capture Bakhmut and the surrounding area in a matter of days. The group of savages and convicts was unable to establish any sort of meaningful control and in late January, Russia began to rely more on its regular forces. Wagner Group's forces have sustained more than 4,100 deaths and 10,000 wounded, including over 1,000 killed between late November and early December near Bakhmut. The Ukrainian State Border Guard Service reiterated that Ukrainian forces control the majority of Bakhmut itself and are conducting successful counterattacks to regain lost positions in the area. However, Ukrainian officials noted that the Russian offensive on Bakhmut has not culminated. Russian forces continued offensive operations around Bakhmut on January 24th, focusing more on the northern side of the city. They began using small unit tactics and squad-sized assault detachments of four to five people to attack and infiltrate urban areas of Bakhmut. Footage posted on January 28th indicates that the Russian forces made marginal advances in the northeastern outskirts. In February, Russian forces solidified gains north of Bakhmut as well as south near Opitna and began pressuring Ukrainian troops. They began using the most elite detachments in order to support human wave attacks in the area. After a couple of days, the Russians managed to capture Rozdolivka and Mykolaivka. Russian forces may feasibly seek to use gains north of Solodar as a launching pad for northeastward attacks near Siversk potentially to support enveloping the Ukrainian defensive position on the west side of the Seversky Donetsk River. In the southwestern part, Russian forces continued to push further in order to cut the T-0504 highway and reduce the supply line for the Ukrainian position. Ukrainian troops maintained constant supply to their grouping in Bakhmut, despite Russian shelling of critical roads. Wagner Group forces began conducting operations to take Krasnohora and Paraskovivka, but Ukrainian troops still held these two settlements. Capturing them will mean a huge tactical advantage since it will allow Russians to cut off the E-40 highway, which was one of the main supply routes. They were now only around 3 kilometers away from achieving that goal. Russian troops have changed their tactics in the Bakhmut area and began focusing less on frontal assaults on small settlements and more on cutting Ukrainian ground lines of communication. On the 11th of February, Russian forces managed to capture the village of Krasnohora with only Paraskovivka separating them from taking over the control of the E-40 highway. The attacks continued on the southern section as well, with Russians gaining limited advances deeper into the Ukrainian positions and fighting for the settlements along the second major supply line for Ukrainians. Around this time, analysts suggested Russian losses had increased to 820 casualties a day. 
By the 13th of February, the Ukrainian government claimed their defenses in the village of Paraskovivka were waning, with fierce battles around the clock. Ukrainian officials stated that Russian forces aimed to capture Bakhmut by the first anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, which would require a significantly higher rate of Russian advance than anything seen for many months. The attacks continued, and sadly, on the 17th of February, Ukrainian forces could no longer hold Paraskovivka. This resulted in Russian forces gaining control over the section of the E-40 highway cutting off one of the most important supply routes. Moreover, they have advanced close to the Ivanivska, capturing which would allow them to maintain control of the second major line of communication. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky stated on February 20th that Ukraine will continue to defend Bakhmut, but not at any cost. It has long been clear that Ukraine would not continue to defend Bakhmut at the risk of seeing large numbers of Ukrainian troops encircled in the city. Wagner Group began approaching the Azov metal processing plant in northern Bakhmut, starting the series of battles for the plant in order to move further to the center of the city. By the 23rd of February, Russian forces have partially gained control over positions along the TO-504 highway, blocking the route and approaching the southeastern outskirts of Ivanivska. Another critical supply route was on the edge of being captured, which would result in a huge logistics problem for the Ukrainian side. Moreover, Russian advances north and northwest of Bakhmut allowed Russian forces to threaten the Kromova-Bakhmut route, one of the last lines of communication that remained under Ukrainian control. The encirclement was as close as ever. After a couple of days, Russian forces managed to advance further and capture the Stupki railway station in the northern part of the city. The situation in Bakhmut was becoming increasingly complicated, with Russian troops continuing to make small progress in moving toward the city center from the northern and eastern outskirts. Wagner troops have advanced within Bakhmut near the meat processing plants and up to the bank of the Bakhmutivka River, which runs through eastern Bakhmut. In addition to that, Russian forces have continued offensive operations in southern Bakhmut, moving north from Opitna. Russian forces temporarily scaled back efforts to encircle Bakhmut from the southwest as well as from the northeast and instead focused on pressuring Ukrainian troops to withdraw from the city by concentrating on the offensive towards the city center. Ukrainian forces still maintained partial control over the TO-504 highway as well as a route from the Kromava, which was the last fully controlled line of communication. In the meantime, Ukrainian officials began setting informational conditions for a potential withdrawal from Bakhmut, but have yet to indicate that Ukrainian forces intend to leave the city. By the 3rd of March, Ukrainian soldiers destroyed two key bridges, creating the possibility for a controlled fighting withdrawal. One across from the Bakhmutivka River in northeastern Bakhmut, and one along the kromava bakhmut route just west of Bakhmut. The destruction of bridges is likely an indicator that Ukrainian troops may seek to prevent Russian movement in eastern Bakhmut and limit potential westward Russian progress. The clashes kept going in northern Bakhmut near the Azam industrial plant and within urban areas of southern and eastern parts. On the 5th of March, Ukrainian forces began conducting limited tactical withdrawals in the eastern bank of the bakhmut ivka River. Russians were yet to cross the river into central Bakhmut. The ability to exhaust Russian troops through continuous urban warfare suggests that a complete withdrawal is unlikely and that Ukrainian forces will continue to fight from the reinforced positions west of the river. Urban conditions and river features will benefit Ukrainian forces if they are able to hold the line from Komava. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky stated at the end of the day on March 6 that he has ordered reinforcements to Bakhmut. Later that day, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin stated that he would not view a Ukrainian withdrawal from Bakhmut as a significant strategy setback, possibly intimating that he favors such a withdrawal. In the meantime, Russian forces continued their attacks on the city center. Footage posted on March 6 shows Wagner Group infantry hanging a Wagner flag and posing in front of the T-34 tank monument in eastern Bakhmut, confirming that Wagner has advanced westward along Maxima Horkoho Street towards Bakhmut's city center. The advances within urban areas of Bakhmut demonstrate that Russian forces can secure limited tactical gains with infantry-led frontal assaults. However, they lack the mechanized forces necessary to exploit the roads west of Bakhmut, which are highly fortified. On the 7th of March, Ukraine partially withdrew from Bakhmut up to the Bakhmutska River. This allowed Russian forces to completely capture the eastern part of the city and now occupy at least 50% of Bakhmut. 
However, the fight was not over yet. The Ukrainian forces managed to get a small victory and push back the enemy further from Komava, strengthening their positions around the critical ground line of communication. In the city center, the Bakhmutka River now marks the front line. The river has become a killing zone for Wagner units, while at the same time, Ukrainian forces are at risk of being cut off. Huge losses forced Russians to slow down their attacks and wait for reinforcements. Prigazin, the commander of the Wagner forces, likely anticipated that Ukrainian troops would entirely withdraw from Bakhmut out of fear of imminent encirclement and hoped that his commitment to Wagner's elite would be sufficient to generate that effect. That was not the case. Ukrainian forces continued the fight with a huge escalation at the Azom plant. Russian soldiers continued ground attacks and on the 14th of March, captured the northern parts of the complex. Prigazin has also emphasized that lack of ammunition degrades the ability to pursue offensives on Bakhmut and stated on March 15th that Wagner has had to expand its encirclement. Additionally, Russian forces have advanced to new positions in northern Bakhmut, just east of the Azom complex. The attacks also continued from the south, with Wagner fighters now holding positions within 600 to 700 meters of the Bakma Administrative Center. On the 20th of March, fighting began close to the avant-garde stadium with Russians trying to progress further from the south. Ukrainian forces began conducting tactical counterattacks on Bakhmut's northwestern and southwestern outskirts. The purpose was to relieve pressure off the TO-504 highway to Bakhmut and allow for a safer flow of supply. Even though Ukrainian forces were able to gain a slight tactical advantage, the constant human wave attacks of Russians did not allow them to push further. On March 25th, Russian forces advanced up the TO-513 highway towards the city center in marginally in southwestern Bakhmut. Two days later, Russians were able to progress further in the Azom complex, capturing it almost in full and coming as closer to the center. On March 28th, Combat footage was posted of Ukrainian infantry engaging in small arms exchanges with Russian forces near the Palace of Culture in the Central Market area. Wagner fighters continued assault operations in the industrial zone in northern Bakhmut, advanced north of the Bakhmut city market in the center of the city, and completely cleared neighborhoods in southern and southwestern parts. Moreover, there was extra pressure on the position near Kromava with the purpose of encircling the remaining Ukrainian units. Footage posted on March 31st shows a Wagner Group flag on a building in the center of Bakhmut within a few blocks within 400 meters of the city administration building. Wagner Group fighters made further advances in central Bakhmut and seized the Bakhmut city administration building on the night of April 2nd. The fights continued on all fronts for the next week, however, without any significant results for either side. After eight months of severe battles, the city is still standing with Ukrainian troops fighting for every centimeter in the western part of Bakhmut. Officials estimate that around 40,000 Russian soldiers died in attempts to capture the city that now became a nightmare for the Russian command. On the other side, around 15,000 Ukrainian soldiers died protecting their country from invaders in the Bakhmut area. The fight grinds on and the Ukrainian command is not ready to retreat. Bakhmut, which became a symbol of the Ukrainian fight for freedom, now lives in the heart of every Ukrainian. No matter what outcome the coming months will bring, the fortress of Bakhmut will be remembered for decades.